everyone. Welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have helped them become real to us because we believe that helps us to draw more power out of them and we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mulstein, and I'm so thrilled to have with us as a first time uh, guest, but but uh, not last time, uh, Dr. Uh, or Professor Emeritus, uh, Noel B. Reynolds. Welcome, Noel. Thanks for being with us. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So first of all, let's uh, just take care of a little bit of uh, business here at the beginning. I am so excited to announce that we are launching our website. With Fingers crossed, we plan on it being live by Tuesday morning. That's Tuesday, January 9th. Uh, it should be live, and we have a bunch of stuff on there. We're going to keep adding, and we'll always keep adding. Uh, and we're looking for other contributors as well, but we're going to have stuff on there. Um, for myself, there'll be a special, uh, what we call a Mulestein Masterclass. I'll do those every now and then. Eventually, I'll do like whole classes, like I want like a 30 lesson on the Old Testament or maybe 45 lessons or something on the Old Testament at some point. Um, we're going to have interfaith roundtable discussions, uh, and but I'm doing a Masterclass right now uh, that will be available on uh, Jerusalem at the time of Lehi and the uh, the route that Lehi probably took as he left Jerusalem and just some things that will help the beginning of the Book of Mormon makes sense to you. I've spent a lot of time putting that together, and we're going to have uh, handouts uh, that I give to my Book of Mormon classes. I'll eventually have books that are out of print that are available there, and um, we have some other people doing things for mental health and and uh, interfaith, and we're even going to have some art things and some business things. So all sorts of things available for a very small subscription fee to keep the website running. Uh, so this is something that I I hope will be exciting for you. We're going to have special episodes of the podcast and probably uh, some early releases uh, for those who are hoping to get it even earlier for preparation for their seminary classes or something. Anyway, we're trying to put all sorts of things on this. So you can, it's called Enlighten Edge EDU. So you can go to patreon.com. So that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com, then do slash Enlighten Edge EDU all one word. So patreon.com slash enlighten edge edu. And you'll be able to get access to all of this, these great things that we're trying to put on this website. Uh, I hope it becomes something that's really useful for you. We want this to be edifying educational experiences. We'll eventually have tours and all sorts of other things on there. And it's going live. We're, we're making this happen. Thanks to all those who are uh, helping us to make it happen. There are a lot of people who have been behind the scenes, especially our producer, BJ, and uh, but uh, so many people. So we're grateful for all of you and thank you. Well, with that taken care of, let me give a brief introduction of, uh, of Dr. Reynolds, who, as I said, he's a, a professor emeritus of political science at, at BYU. Uh, he received his master's and his PhD from Harvard University, and he's been a, a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and Edinburgh University and Hebrew University. And uh, he's been involved with uh, Farms, when it was farms of the Maxwell Institute, uh, and I believe, uh, if I remember right, uh, you were in uh, uh, leadership in at BYU. Uh, is that not correct? I, a couple of times, I was an associate academic vice president. Yeah, that's that's what I was remembering, but I didn't want to say the the title incorrectly. <laughs> uh, you've also served in the church in all sorts of ways, including at the as the president of the Mount Timpanogos Utah Temple. Um, but uh, I, I, you're known for just great scholarship in a number of fields, but especially, well, not especially, but it, for what I, for terms of this podcast, especially in the Book of Mormon, um, and uh, as someone that I've looked up to in, in terms of uh, how to, to be a, a broad and a deep scholar at the same time, and how to be a great scholar and a faith-filled scholar at the same time, a, a disciple scholar. So I'm grateful to have you on with us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're going to, uh, as we're jumping into the Book of Mormon, this is the week where we're finally getting into the Book of Mormon text. And uh, I think that uh, Noel and I won't get too far into the text, but um, <laughs> uh, we're, we, we've always uh, taken this approach, but I think we'll do it even more here uh, in our Book of Mormon year, where we'll let uh, other wonderful and fantastic co podcasts try and cover the, the 
whole breadth of any particular reading assignment, but we're going to just take some subjects that we really like and we'll do some deep dives on them. So uh, I believe Dr. Reynolds has been researching on a specific uh, topic that I'm also very interested in and, and publishing on it for quite a while. So we'll just let you take us where, where you want to go. Where should we go? Well, this last couple of years, I've become uh, very interested in this uh, literature on scribal scribalism in the ancient Near East. And uh, I don't come to that topic as an expert, so I had to do a lot of reading. And uh, but it's just what is so intriguing to me is how it applies uh, quite easily and obviously uh, to the Book of Mormon. Um, the uh, I don't know how, how many people realize there's basically. Uh, f uh, four ancient writing systems that uh, uh, have been developed in different parts of the world uh, about 5,000 years ago. and uh, uh, But the Middle East had two of these, and that's the, uh, the, uh, the Mesopotamian and the Egyptian. And these were, uh, so these are in operation before the time of Abraham. Yeah. And uh, and Egyptian clearly provided the writings, the dominant writing system in Abraham's uh, life. Uh, the things he wrote, uh, uh, the culture that he participated in uh, as a visitor and in other ways uh, was Egyptian. And so he is an expert with Egyptian. And uh, we... Uh, we, we kind of forget that. We think, well, Abraham was speaking Hebrew and, and uh, his kids are speaking Hebrew and so forth. And we don't, we don't really know. They had uh, uh, the, the competing language and the one that Hebrew comes out of is the West Semitic languages, yeah. which are to the West uh, and what we would call Palestine, Israel today and north of that, south of that. Uh, <laughs> Hebrew probably doesn't really exist per se in Abraham's day. We we use phrases like Proto-Hebrew and things like that because we don't yeah. know exactly what he's speaking or what's going on at that time period. Well, I was very impressed, uh, uh, Kerry, when I uh, realized that the uh, epigraphers who stick to uh, basic archaeological facts uh, uh, are of the opinion that uh, you can't really prove that there was any Hebrew writing before the ninth century BC. Yeah. And uh, yeah. although and I, I think you can push that date back a little bit. Uh, if we're, it depends on how seriously you take the, what we call the song of the sea in Exodus 15 being right, actually right. Uh, coming from, uh, Moses and and Miriam and so on, but yeah, yeah, you're right. As far as what well, physical things that we can look at and see, uh, yeah, and we can't get that early. They just yeah. and those that stick really uh, religiously to the inscriptions as yeah. uh, the limiting uh, evidence, uh, they won't go back any further than that. And and of course, I'm not an expert, so I on this that I I would claim to be able to prove it one way or the other. Right. But oh, no, you're right. We don't have any inscriptions earlier than that. But uh, clearly, by the time we get inscriptions, it's already a developed language. So it has to exist before then. The but how long is, is the question? And but but there is pretty good evidence of these uh, West Semitic script. Absolutely. Dividing up into the languages of that area uh, in that ninth century, yeah. about about that time period. And Hebrew, a lot of people think Hebrew may have been the first alphabet to come out of that, thereby becoming, uh, if that's true, uh, the first alphabetic script, because all the older scripts were not alphabetic. They uh, were syllabic or logographic, whatever. Yep. And uh, the uh, so Hebrews, in terms of alphabetic script, it's very early. In terms of being a writing system, it's kind of light. Yeah, and, yeah. And this yeah. becomes good, good point. And this is a really critical kind of point for trying to understand the Book of Mormon, because here we have Lehi coming out of Jerusalem in 600, 
And that century just before Lehi left Jerusalem is the century when Bible scholars today think that most of the Old Testament was put into writing, having been just oral tradition before mm -hmm. that writing system was available. Absolutely. But Lehi and Nephi claim to have a written version of all of this that goes back at least to Joseph and maybe to Abraham. Yeah. Now that puts the, that puts the brass plates and the Book of Mormon on very f different footing than the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, we might say here, the brass plates to the rescue. <laughs> because uh, we've got uh, the academic world is pretty tentative about, you know, how, how much we can trust the Old Testament. Right. Uh, uh, there's a, just all kinds of doubts and criticisms that have been raised. Uh, and there's, you know, a lot of good response to that. But underlying all of it is this problem of how early they could write things in Hebrew, how early the Old Testament materials got into Hebrew. And then you've got this competing claim that Nephi and Lehi walk out of Jerusalem with a Egyptian version that goes all the way back probably to Abraham. And uh, we include Moses probably in Egyptian. I mean, Moses was an Egyptian. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're, the, we're the first five books of Moses written in Egyptian. That's a possibility. Uh, it would seem like a probability uh, on this story. So anyway, uh, this has, uh, like I say, brass plates to the rescue here. Uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, then turns us to the question of uh, how, do, how are these languages and scripts and documents maintained across centuries, uh, even millennia? And, uh, and the really interesting thing that uh, caught my attention uh, just a few years ago, and although Brent Gardner had noticed this uh, a decade earlier, and I hadn't picked up on it, but uh, the uh, and that is all of the archaeology and history and language study that has kind of come together uh, at, uh, in our century, in this century. Uh, so there's thousands of contributions from different scholars. Uh, that, that go into this have uh, realized, come to the conclusion that this was possible because of scribal schools. Right. Uh, yeah. That go that go back uh, probably five thousand years, and uh, uh, and we've learned a lot about those scribal schools. They uh, they tend to be family based, and uh, for each generation, some promising kids would be uh, taught not only their own language, but they would be taught the relevant classical languages. Uh, uh, and uh, they would become participants in keeping the old traditional texts going, but also in adding new ones, and also in serving the needs for writing in their own contemporary society. Uh, right. Which yeah, was, and, and that, oh, go ahead. Well, no, no, you go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, typically the, the needs for writing, at least initially, are more about bureaucracy and having a functioning society yeah. than it is about the literary works and so on. Right. I mean, the, the writing typically stems from uh, laundry lists and tax items and will develop into literary uh, forms and, and yeah. projects. Yeah, you're more of an expert on this stuff than I am, but... Uh, would you agree that uh, uh, probably at any one point in time, uh, the number of scribes who are actually dealing effectively with uh, traditional texts and uh, literary materials was probably a small percentage of the scribes? Oh, yeah. Very, very small. Well, most most them, are business uh, yeah, oriented, yeah. right? Writing contracts. Uh, yeah. Keeping track of commodities. Helping judges in the legal system, yeah, uh, priests in the temple, 
uh, had need for scribes uh, and, yeah. all, and and kings and emperors needed to send letters. Yeah. And uh, I needed to know what was going on in the world. Yeah. Literary works are by far the smallest. So in fact, I'll, I'll be, uh, by the time this uh, video is airing, I'll be about to start to teach a, a course I teach every other year. Um, and I've teamed on it with different people called the texts of the ancient Near East. Yeah. And we focus on literary texts, which means that there are a whole lot of texts that we leave out and, and we have to engage in a debate. Well, what really is literary and what's not? And there are some that are kind of gray, <laughs> right? But, but there are yeah. a whole bunch. They're just like, yeah, yeah, that's interesting stuff, but it's not literary. And stuff that you, you know, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert on any of that. Uh, but it's, but in Mesopotamia, uh, you've got these, uh, scribal schools and and after so many centuries their they their texts they're working in are in dead languages it's like latin was in the middle ages uh you know nobody's speaking it on the street but the scholars have to know it yeah. and uh and uh so uh and in the uh the scribal schools the 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 top scribes the ones that were but most thoroughly educated in all this, uh, we travel a lot. That's the other thing. That, uh, I'm getting most of this. This was pulled together, and I should recognize uh, Carol Vendertorn, uh, who mm -hmm. was, became president of the University of Amsterdam about the time he wrote this book. But he took all this earlier material and pulled it together so that uh, people like me could read it and, and, uh, and understand how it uh, fits together. And he was, he was using the Egyptian and the Mesopotamian materials that have been found to advance uh, his uh, view that the uh, Israelites, although they were centuries behind in terms of having written materials, that they, the dynamics of an oral society are such that they were basically using the same system yeah. of, of scribal schools. And that the scribal schools in Jerusalem, uh, during that time between when the Assyrians captured the Northern Kingdom and then the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, between those two is when these scribal schools basically produced most of the books of the... Uh, Old Testament. Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. I mean, it's, I, it, to me, it's pretty clear that uh, they're a somewhat Egyptian based scribal school idea. That's where they're getting their experience. That's their, their closest large neighbor. Uh, and uh, that's the most longstanding prestigious scribal school around and so on. I, I think you're right. That's, that's where their ideas are coming from. And you're, you're identifying, I think a really crucial century as well, where, uh, we see a real shift from the emphasis being passing things on orally to passing them on in writing. The, 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 the thing that kind of jumps out at you is uh, Lehi is not a Judite. Right. He is a Manassite. Yeah. And uh, now Manasseh was Joseph's oldest son. And the Manassites, when they got to Israel, uh, as things were divided, as the uh, territory was divided up by Joshua, uh, the Manassites got a lot of the prime territory right in the middle of of the whole land, on both sides of the River Jordan, on both sides, and yeah. uh, including the uh, uh, ancient holy sites, where Jacob and Abraham uh, had had uh, special experiences. That was all in Manasseh territory, and yeah. uh, and and Lehi claims to be uh, finds in the brass plates that he is a uh, uh, descendant of Manasseh, uh, and th the brass plates are written in Egyptian. Lehi is fluent in Egyptian. Or at least with the Egyptian characters, I don't, I don't know if we know the language for sure, but it's certainly written in Egyptian characters and maybe Egyptian language. But anyway, sorry, I keep going. Now. Well, uh, the possibility that, that that leaps out at me mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, the Manassites 
would have been very likely to have kept things in Egyptian because they got them originally in Egyptian. Hmm. Uh, you've got uh, whatever Abraham, when Abraham, we have the book of Abraham, right, which was given to Joseph Smith after uh, he translated the Book of Mormon, and uh, and Abraham tells us in there that he's writing this for his posterity. Yeah. Well, now who threw it away? Isaac, <laughs> Jacob. Or his great grandson Joseph. I don't think any of them threw it away. I think they treasured that uh, material, that, uh, that that biography, and other things that Abraham had written for them. Uh, we don't get any direct writing from Isaac and Jacob, but Joseph, we do. And what would you think of this idea? Uh, is Joseph the one who is trained as a scribe? And does that explain why he is so good at Egyptian so quickly when he gets to Egypt? Does it explain this, the uh, problematic relationship he has with his brothers? Right. Which very much looks like the problematic relationship Nephi has with his brothers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, it's, it does seem like uh, J Jacob is giving Joseph special attention. And if that's going to, come in any form it's going to come in in terms of education and yeah that kind of thing yeah and uh even the coat of many colors there's something about the sleeves and being yeah. something that can work in an office um uh, i mean now there's nothing in the text that tells us that that's what happened right but looking at the uh the the cultural context it's not hard to get to that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, and uh, and so we've got uh, Nephi says he's writing uh, the small plates in Egyptian, the language of my father. Right. And he says right. language. He's not talking about script here. I right. think when we get down to Reformed Egyptian at the end of the Book of Mormon, we're probably talking about a script. But, uh, but here, uh, and... The language of the Egyptians is very much a live thing, even though the Judites in Jerusalem uh, uh, are not featuring Egyptian in their work and in their literature. Uh, the, the Jewish kings uh, are thought by many to have employed Egyptian scribes just, just to keep them on top of things. Right. And to, to deal with materials that their scribes can't deal with. But it makes sense uh, uh, to me, anyway, that, uh, that these descendants of Manasseh, uh, you know, at what point do Joseph's descendants cease to share elite status in Egypt? Because as long as, uh, for as many generations as Manasseh and Ephraim and their children, their descendants, have elite status uh and if the israelites are in egypt for three or four centuries uh they are educated they're yeah. taking uh, and they uh would have be and they would be in a very good position to establish and maintain their own scribal schools and, yeah, and as time, you, oh sorry go ahead but you go ahead I was going to say, and as, I, as I, I believe you're saying, especially the descendants of Joseph, right? Descendants of yeah. Jacob in general, but especially Joseph's descendants are going to have a different place in that society right. than, than those of his brothers. And, I mean, who did Joseph marry? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. An Egyptian, uh, the daughter of an Egyptian high priest, right? Well, I mean, it may be a Semitic Egyptian at this point, but still, it's, a, it's someone in that society. And what language does she speak to her children? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's uh, oh, do, most likely who, Egyptian, right? And who do they marry? Yeah, her friends, or are they going across the river and finding uh, Judites and others to marry? I, it's the whole thing just sounds to me like Egyptian could have been a very uh, consistent 
prominent element in the Manasseh Ephraimite heritage, uh, clear down to the time they get to Israel. And I'm wondering if that isn't part of the reason they were given such choice uh, lands and, uh, and, and towns uh, when they got there. Uh, Jerusalem wasn't the center of the universe when they got there. No, no you're right. Uh, the area around Bethel and, and so on, Shechem, and yeah, those are yeah. The, the important areas, uh, at least yeah. religiously. Well, plus uh, Hebron, but yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, if uh, taking then, then we look at you know we are talking about the Book of Mormon today, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so if we go back to those opening verses, I mean, it just all of a sudden with with this stuff in mind, notice how you read the opening verses different. I mean, who starts off by telling you in the first sentence that they were taught in all the learning of their father? Would you ever do that when you introduce yourself to somebody? <laughs> not, not usually. No, <laughs> uh, we wouldn't. We don't do that, do we? Uh, that's. But I was taught in all the learning of my father, and then going down, uh, uh, still in verse one. Therefore, I make a record of my proceedings in my days. Uh, so he's telling his readers that he can make a record of his life and his uh, activities in his life. And then he says, I make the record in the language of my father. Why is it the language of his father, not the language of his brothers hmm. or his family? Lehi is uh, uh, pursuing this possibility. Lehi is trained in Egyptian as a scribe. And uh, that, that would be my reading of that. And Nephi has also uh, had that training. And, uh, and that, that language may not uh, be a, uh, with, within the capability, the training, the experience of the other members of the family. Yeah. And Which just maybe say, along those lines, uh, yeah. uh, we know uh, just from some uh, ostraca that we found in ostraca, just for our audience or, or uh, uh, broken pottery sherds uh, where people have been writing on them, making notes and so on. And, and we know of uh, several where it, it becomes clear that there are um, scribal schools in the, the kingdom of Judah, which is where they're living now, um, where people are uh, trained in Egyptian. They know Egyptian and they're using Egyptian script and they're intermixing it with the Hebrew and so on and so there, that kind of language school you're positing for, uh, or scribal school you're positing for Lehi and Nephi, we know it existed. And then he, he goes on right in the next verse. It makes a, in the record in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the, the Egyptians. Uh, and I know, you know, a lot of Latter-day Saints have read that as well. Maybe he's talking about Egyptian script. Uh, although it's hard to see a reason at this point to jump out of alphabetic Hebrew, which is now developed by Nephi's time is well developed, is actually been standardized across uh, 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 the land of the Israelites. They have uh, standardized both the script and the language pretty much uh, by the end of the seventh century. Uh, but yeah, I, and I would guess the only reason, and we do get uh, hints of this later in the the language where they talk about space and so on, um, is that uh, Egyptian writing could be more concise, right? Where you can get three syllables in one symbol and so on. So if they're needing to save space or difficult to write on metal or something, then maybe you uh, you go along those lines. But in the end, we don't know. The, uh, the other thought that occurs to me on that is that uh, one of the possibility is that if if Nephi if the Manassites have treated Egyptian as their classical language in mm -hmm. which their scriptures have come down, Nephi is appending his proceedings to that record. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. That's a really interesting. And idea. So to be part of that, it needs to be an Egyptian. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but now. Uh, the Bible that we have and, and is really the only 
real Hebrew text we have coming out of that period uh, does not mention Manassites like uh, scribal schools. No, they're no. they're northerners. Yeah, you know, they're they're, they're uh, focusing on the southern tradition for sure. Yeah, and so the Manassites they're outsiders in Jerusalem for that century, that long century that they're there as refugees, having been cast out of their own lands in Samaria and uh, Shechem and so forth. And, uh, but is Nephi uh, here by using the language of the Egyptians uh, to write first and second Nephi, is he uh, uh, maintaining the tradition that he has been taught? in this scribal school and, uh, and making his writing continuous with Abraham and Joseph and Zenos mm -hmm. and so forth. That's, that's, that's an interesting thought. Uh, maybe I can just also to just help yeah. our audience uh, yeah. just explain a little bit uh, that it's worth noting that uh, the as we say Judahite and uh, Manassehite and so on, that uh, sometimes I would guess even they were conflating certain terms. So we have, the problem is we have 12 tribes and we have two kingdoms. Yeah. And one of the kingdoms shares the same name as a tribe. And so yeah. it gets <laughs> it gets tricky right. because um, you'll have someone like uh, Lehi, who is from the tribe of Manasseh, but in the kingdom of Judah. Uh, and yeah. we can document several times where there were large, large migrations of people from the northern tribes coming down into the southern kingdom, uh, including during the days of Isaiah and Hezekiah and so on, but uh, other times as well. Um, and so it's not a surprise to find, uh, you know, uh, someone from Manasseh in the kingdom of Judah. But the the problem is that the word for being, uh, you know, in Hebrew it would be Yehudit or Judahite, as you say, the, the word for being of the tribe of of Judah would be Yehudit, and the word for being a member of the kingdom of Judah would be Yehudit. Yeah. So Lehi is a, a Manassehite who is a Judahite in terms of what kingdom he's part of. Kingdom. And and we end up eventually translating Yehudit as Jew. And it's not it, that that uh, when we use that term, it's usually applies to people just after the time of Lehi. So or around that same time period. So I think that's why we're going to see Nephi referring to himself as a Jew sometimes. Right. Yeah, he um, does. Right. Yeah, and it's because he's he, he's a Judahite. He identifies as a kingdom of Judahite, not necessarily a tribe of Judahite, right? And so uh, that's worth keeping in mind that I think that that within the kingdom of Judah, uh, you definitely have you have enough people coming in from the north that most likely there are areas in Jerusalem where these are where people from Manasseh live and areas where these are people from Ephraim live and so on and so on. And uh, there's going to be some integration and some degree of not integrating, just like in modern societies today. Uh, but hopefully that can help us not get too confused when he talks about um, being a Jew, but also being from Manasseh. Yeah, that, well, I'm glad you clarified that because I think a lot of people struggle with that uh, seeming confusion in the text, and it's not a confusion. It's uh, yeah, yeah. He 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 does see himself as a Jew, yeah, part of the part of the Jewish kingdom. And, yeah. Uh, well, that very next sentence, and I'm going on into verse three here. I know the record which I make to be true. I make it with mine own hand. Yeah. And and clearly, in what goes on when he gets to the promised land, Nephi is making his own plates to to write on, and uh, and this is another feature, another uh, facility of uh, uh, the major scribal schools, is that they had workshops that produced all the materials they needed, the paper, the ink, the. Then maybe you could buy the paper on the market, you know. Get yeah. Well, papyrus. no paper, but papyrus or something. Yeah, yeah. The ink and the uh, and certainly the tools that they wrote with. Uh, there was an interesting book on uh, scribal tools uh, that came out a few years ago, and apparently iron pens uh, were a uh, standard part of a scribal kit, uh, toolkit, because they uh, had to write on metal and on stone mm. and uh most of the metal writing i assume was writing on people's private property objects uh, 
swords and pans and things like that. But uh, but uh, Nephi, uh, not only has he learned the language, he has also learned the skills of the shop, the workshop, yeah. and he can produce uh, those materials. The, the other function that uh, uh, Professor Vander Torn uh, uh, documents in his book, uh, um, I should have, uh, his book, I should have finished that comment. Carol Vander Torn, the book is Scribal Culture and the Making of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, that's not the only book on the subject, but I think it's one that, one of the first ones that brought all this together in a way that uh, broader audiences can understand it. The other great function they have, of course, is maintaining a library. And uh, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, the word for library and the word for uh, treasury is the same word. Uh, that, uh, And so Laban has a treasury, but I, and he's a cousin of, Nephi, of Lehi. Uh, it seems to me that it's very easy to claim that Laban's that Laban's specialty within the scribal school, the Manassite scribal school, is keeping keeping guarding the documents, the mm. the the principal uh, materials that have to be taken care of. All that uh, all that raises another question. Have you ever thought about this one? Uh, when were the brass plates manufactured? Yeah, actually, I've thought about that quite a bit uh yeah. well my guess would be it has to have been within the uh like 20 to 100 years before this uh right and and maybe i can uh, just give a little bit of my reasoning and then i'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts and so yeah, on yeah. but um as you mentioned and we, we touched on just briefly before there's a, a real transition uh culturally in israel but all throughout that region uh, in to say uh, between 700 and 600 uh, BC, where uh, things are passed down primarily orally before this, and then uh, the idea of writing them down really grows up, and you can actually see it in the Hebrew Bible. So, for example, the earlier prophets, people like Elijah and Elisha, we right. don't have any of their writings. Right. And they're probably not literate, but if they are, they're, it doesn't seem like they're writing these prophecies down or so on. And you start to get it like around Amos, uh, who just barely precedes Hosea and Isaiah and so on. And But once you get to that that particular era, so like mid-700s, right, what, right, about 750 or so on, um, then you get the what we call the writing prophets. But after that, that's that's what is the norm that you write these things down and so it's as you said in that same time period i would guess during the days of of hezekiah they begin taking all these records that weren't these literary things like the, all the prophecies and so on but kingdom records right day books and and so on these uh, kind of functional things that we've talked about they start taking all of those records in much the same way mormon would do later for nephites yeah. Uh, they take all this and they start to compile it and 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 write all of this together. So the Manassites may have had uh, all sorts of writings that they've had for a long time, passed down from who knows how long, probably built some literary and some functional things. Um, but this seems to be the time period where you would start to say, okay, let's let's take all these different things and com compile them and make a a, a, a more highly literary record uh and so i would just guess it was a part of that trend although there's no way we can know and i'm interested to hear counter thoughts but um uh, my guess would be that whatever they've had just like whatever the judahites had right uh whatever they had before they're compiling it at a specific time period including the writings of moses and whatever else right so those are just my thoughts i'd love to hear yours <laughs> Uh, I think I think it probably is that the brass plates are a recent product, um, and that possibly Lehi was involved either financially or uh, personally in manufacturing the brass plates, and that's why he thought he had a right mm -hmm. to ask Laban. I mean, how does Nephi Lehi think he can just add, send his sons to ask Laban for the plates? Yeah. He's got. He's got some some kind of claim on it. 
Yep, I agree. And, uh, but because Lehi has been driven out of Jerusalem, basically, Laban knows he doesn't have to play ball. Yeah. And uh, that Lehi, whatever rights Lehi has, uh, don't count anymore. Yep, he's largely become an outcast at this point, right? But that brings yeah. up uh, another really interesting point that I, I, I think a lot of us never uh, stop to think about. Uh, and, and I think it's evidence of this kind of move from uh, that they're right in the middle of that move from morality to, to literary uh, or, or not, not just literacy, although literacy is still low. Most people can't read or write, um, but, but kind of a literary and, and writing uh, emphasis. And that is Lehi doesn't have scriptures. Right. If he's going to take scriptures with him, he has to go back to Jerusalem and get them from someone because they are still a very, very rare commodity. Most people don't have them. It's it's the idea of having a whole bunch of copies of something just doesn't exist yet. And uh, I mean, people think of a prophet, they think, what? prophet doesn't have scripture that's weird right but no they <laughs> I, I mean he's familiar with the yeah. teachings and and nephi is familiar with the teachings and the commandments and everything else but not because they own a set but because they hear these things read uh yeah. so there's there's still that really oral element that's at play here it, it, and uh i think that's right the, a couple of other things that occurred to me that would explain what motivated the uh uh, uh, Manassites to create a metal record, yeah, a metal version of it. This is special, and for a number of reasons. Uh, but the uh, but one of those is they are sitting there in Jerusalem at a time when they are witnessing how the Judahites are taking their oral tradition and trying to come trying to harmonize uh their scriptures trying to, trying to get these different oral traditions down to the same thing in a written text and uh our, our bible scholars find all kinds of evidence for this harmonizing uh, uh and uh, for the existence of multiple uh, uh versions of the older traditions well, they, uh, it seems to me that a Manassite scribal school, especially if they were uh, saw themselves as religiously conservative, uh, could see their written tradition from Abraham being threatened by all this harmonizing activity in the Judite schools. Mm. And uh, to the extent, but the Judites, they're the ones that have the political and economic upper hand. Yeah, at this point, for sure. And socially, they're the, yeah. they're the upper. And, uh, and, and they are starting to integrate with the Jews. We've got Laban spending his carousing in the evening with the elders of the city. Those are yeah. Judas. Yeah, know. because by this point, all of the, the tribes have, in the north have been scattered. So anyone else is a guest in Judah, as it were. They're refugees, and they've been there quite a while now. They've yeah. been there three or four generations. Yep. Which means they're probably intermarrying. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, but they certainly don't have the upper hand socially right. or really in any other way. Uh, it's very possible, it seems to me, that to the extent that a Manassite scribal school had this uh, scriptural record, uh, they may have been anxious that uh, that their descendants would uh, switch teams uh, mm. and be influenced by the Judahite uh, activity, which they didn't like. And, uh, and so thought, and the, and the phrase that comes out uh, uh, in Job and, and, and Jeremiah and uh, Isaiah, uh, things like, uh, an everlasting witness or written with an iron pen. Yeah. Uh, you know, that kind of language. And that may be exactly what they're doing when they uh, put this, uh, uh, take their scriptural record and put it on brass plates. Um, now, it is a very special thing. And, uh, uh, and you know, Laban is very 
uh, it, it's it's in the treasury, in the library, and Laban's responsible to protect it. And uh, um, have you heard about that? There's another Manassite brass plate story. No. No. This is a 17th century story. Huh. Uh, and I stumbled across it just using Google on the internet. <laughs> so it's, it's not something that any, any of the scholars have picked up on. Um, there was a guy, an Englishman, who spent his life on the west coast of India as a sea captain. His name was Alexander Hamilton, but he was down there. He was, he was down there at least 30 years, just going back and forth up and down the coast, uh, carrying merchandise to the different ports. Uh, and he talks about the Jewish colony at Kerala, which is the southernmost part along that coast. And, and that community of Jews uh, is thought at one point to have been well over 20,000 people. But by the but by the twentieth century, uh, twenty first century, I should say, it's like ten people, mm. so it's, it's totally gone. Mm. But this sea captain named Alexander Hamilton uh, went back to England when he retired. Now a man of means, and writes his history. Uh, about the uh, about India, it's an, uh, to update Englishmen on their understanding of the that part of the world. And he mentions this Jewish colony that he had a lot of business with, and what they told him in uh, the late 1600s was that they were descendants of Manasseh, hmm. Who had been captured in Jerusalem and taken to the eastern end of the Babylonian Empire. And of course, we know that uh, Babylon uh, didn't hold together very long after that. Right. Uh, it, uh, it, the Persians took over and, uh, and they weren't interested in this Jewish colony that they had on their eastern, and they let him go. And they migrated straight south. And if you go straight south from the eastern end of the Babylonian Empire, you come to that western coast of India. Hmm. And as they migrated down that coastline, they found a king in the Kerala area who was delighted to have uh, them come in. They were uh, they still had a literate element in their society, and uh, he used them to strengthen his armies and his business and other things. Mm -hmm. So he was very positive. He took them in. It became their colony after uh, who knows how many uh, uh, generations. And they claim to have brought their records on brass plates. Huh. I have not heard that before. That's interesting. So that's all this it, kind of... They're orally passing down this history to this English gentleman is how we've gotten that's, this, that's right? Exactly. And and so he publishes this in 1720 or something. Back so that's in another great example of uh, taking oral tradition and, and making it a written text. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, uh, so Nephi, Nephi's brass plate story isn't the only one coming out of Jerusalem in 16 in 600. Uh, that's really, really interesting. Yeah. I've not heard that. So, it's, and that's fun. I mean, uh, you know, I guess to be clear for our audience, we uh, we can be sure that there are uh, scribal traditions in Judah and in Manasseh and so on. And uh, and we know from the Book of Mormon that at least some of those have brass plates, right? And so now we have this other group that we're hearing about with brass plates. But a lot of this is putting uh, us putting two and two and two and two and two together oh, yeah. but uh yeah, but uh i think we're on really really safe ground saying that there were scribal traditions that at least some of those scribal traditions were influenced by egyptian we've we got good evidence for that and uh that um uh because of what we know from the book of mormon that there are those in manasseh who are passing down records that are different than what the jews have that are written on brass plates. So that's, that's interesting stuff. 
And, and uh, going back to the uh, the Nephite experience, uh, is it uh, Benjamin? Uh, Mosiah tells his sons that the brass plates are written in uh, Egyptian. Yeah. And that Neph- Lehi was trained in Egyptian, and that's why he was able to read them. Yeah. But that's also why the Nephite scribal school, which we haven't gotten into yet, and that's a whole other story, but the Nephites have a scrub school, I would maintain, uh, that uh, maintains training in the Egyptian language. Yeah. Uh, one, so that they can study their holy scriptures. And when they say holy scriptures, they're talking about the brass plates. Right. And so they can, uh, they, so their, their scribes can read that, translate it for them into whatever the Nephite language is at any particular point in time. And the uh, and then at the end, they have the option of writing in Egyptian or Hebrew. Somebody still knows Egyptian. Yep. And that's keeping that dead language alive for a millennium. Yeah, well, and we can explore that, I, I think, even just a little bit further. So here we are in First uh, Nephi 1, gone through like verse 3. Um, and we're going to jump to the very end of the Book of Mormon and, and touch on a couple of points in the middle. But I yeah. think it's uh, it's worth doing so because you're right. You bring up this really interesting uh, point where we learn that uh, that Benjamin and Mosiah and Mosiah's sons, uh, who are direct descendants of Nephi um, uh, or they seem to be anyway, they they're talking about it's clear that that elite group, right? is making sure that they're teaching their children how to read these records that are written in Egyptian. So this has been passed on, as you said, specifically so they can. Well, we get to Mormon, and then, of course, Maru and I, Mormon is also very clear. I am a descendant of Nephi, right? Right. So uh, he's... uh, He's a a descendant of Lehi, and then he's a descendant of Nephi. Yeah, that's exactly right. So he's... Both in there. Yeah, so it's he's not just a Lehite. He's it's he's making sure we know it's specifically through Nephi, which I would guess is that same father to son chain that's just gone all the way down for a thousand years at that point, in in being able to read Egyptian and be able to write in Egyptian. And again, whatever that means is that Hebrew with Egyptian script, or is that Egyptian language with Egyptian script, or modified version as both, or whatever. By the time we get to Mormon, we know that it's all modified in some way or another, but. Um, it, it really does suggest, and it's probably part of why, I mean, obviously Mormon is chosen because of the amazing person he is, but it, it has to come into play. Well, this is someone who can read and write in the records that we're asking him to deal with. Um, right. and, and, uh, it, if not, then we've got to either teach him or find someone else. Right. So, but, but he seems to be from that scribal school that goes from Lehi to Nephi on down. Uh, one thing that uh i only realized this last year uh even after teaching this for so many years um of all you know we have all these different kind of lines of uh inheritance of authority and social position and uh politics a military uh priesthood uh the only the only line for which we can document every transition generational transition from the beginning to the end is the scribal responsibility hmm. every transition is documented in the yeah. text yeah that, that's interesting because you do get that like i i received these records from my father and i saw him write it with his own hand and so on uh, and, and that last article i did and the, the last thing i scribes i just trace it every one of them Huh. we get it and and the and the and a couple of them uh explain the responsibility how they understood that responsibility right which is very helpful that's interesting you're you're right i mean in some ways i'd never thought of it that way before but in some ways the book of mormon is not only the product of a scribal school it's that scribal school self-record uh, exactly. Yeah. And the, and I mean the fact that that's being documented at every uh, generational transition shows that that was really important to Mormon. Mm-hmm. 
he's part of that. And yeah, when he, he is. when when Amron comes to him, he's a ten year old kid. I observe that you're a sober child and that you were quick to observe. Where did he note that? Yeah. Mormon is in his school. Uh interesting. Hmm. And and uh Mormon is a trained scribe. Uh, in yeah, that but situation. he has to be. Yeah. And I mean, there's, Amron, there's no way around it. <laughs> and Amron's desperate for a successor. He's already hidden all the records up in that hill in Shim. And uh, he's looking and and he sees this kid. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. And yeah, yeah, it is interesting that, I mean, it's so uh, like we w would see in so many older cultures that uh, you're going to find that uh, often the uh the elite are trained in a number of things so you're going to have the warriors are also the people who are yeah. trained in in literature and so on and so on and that's exactly yeah. what you see again and again in the book of mormon including with mormon and moroni yeah it's uh it's an interesting you know how how widespread was the the literacy thing for example and uh and on the one hand we can document this scribal school uh, apparently i think it's the royal scribal school that nephi establishes and the king that he appoints is responsible for maintaining that because mm -hmm. when it comes back online uh after the lost pages right. uh, when, when that story comes back online it's the king yep that, that's in charge of the uh of the records and uh and of yeah. making sure that his children can read and write in, yeah. in that language of the records so uh even though there's been over 300 years since nephi died uh it seems to me that th that nephi established that tradition that was part of the royal responsibility and the kings keep that for uh two or three generations before it's transferred to uh before they you know then they have the judges and then the uh when they divide the judgeship and and alma goes off and takes the church uh the the nephi doesn't want to have that responsibility yeah and he tells lehi no nephi or alma he says no you take that yeah and the same thing happens again after Helaman becomes chief judge, and then they divide it again later. The records go back with the uh, with the prophet, not with the chief judge. Yeah. So it's Although, uh, interestingly, the prophets seem to be descended from the same line, but yeah, yeah, they're all they're all related. Yeah, those guys are all related, and, uh, and like you say, uh, I think that's important to see. They're the ones that are getting the training in uh, military affairs uh as well as the reading and writing and care of the records uh, and they also the priesthood uh goes through them and when, when christ chooses nephi to, as the lead apostle he's part of that crew mm, yep yeah yep you're right that's that same line right and he is yeah. uh not only going to be the head of the apostles but he's keeping the record and then his son and sons and brothers and sons and yeah uh, we kind of lose down. it a little bit in fourth nephi we don't have too much information but uh, it just suddenly surfaces again with mormon or there, amaron there are no gaps there are no gaps down oh, to you, amaron. you can does it tell us who keeps the record all yep. the way down to amaron oh well, i'll have to look yeah. at that again nice yeah. okay yeah no gaps huh. wow it, this meant a lot to mormon yeah wow yeah, you're right, because fourth Nephi is pretty short. So whatever he's including, he thinks is important. <laughs> well, it's Amos, Amos, Amron. Oh, you're right. We do have those names. Huh. Uh, Amron's brother of the last Amos. Right. And he has the records for 15 years, hides them away, uh, designates Mormon as being the next heir, and tells him to come back when he's 24. Uh, he doesn't come back till he's in his thirties because other things happen, but, yeah. uh, uh, hmm. That's well, fun stuff. And, I, and I think you're right to, again, caution our listeners that, uh, this is interpretation. 
Yeah. Uh, these guys don't ever spell it out the way we're spelling it out. But 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 the, the but the uh, the thing to remember is that in an oral society, which all pre Gutenberg societies were oral societies, uh, there when a guy says I'm writing the record of my days i'm writing it in a language that none of you understand uh, and my own family doesn't all understand it uh and i'm making these plates with my own hands there is no possibility that he has not been trained as a scribe yeah it's, yeah the, the the fact that they keep talking about egyptian automatically limits this to even if the scribe even if the society is more literate than most and most societies yeah for a very long time are as small. We're usually talking, you know, a couple of percentages yeah. uh, of people who are literate, but even if they're more literate, the people who can do this are, it's, it's a small, small group. I don't think most people are being trained in Egyptian and whatever else they're writing and speaking in. There's one other angle on this. I don't know. Are we out of time or uh, let's, wanna... let's go just a few more minutes. Okay. Um, the, uh, he talks about the learning of the Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, now he could mean Jews broadly speaking, um, but there's something that developed in Jerusalem in the seventh century. Uh, again, this is uh, scholars of Hebrew rhetoric have uh, argued this that um, that as these writings were being put into as these Hebrew traditions are being put into writing that they develop their own rhetorical tradition. So Hebrew rhetoric is not dependent on Greek rhetoric. It actually right. precedes it by a century at least. And this is where we get all that business about chiasmus and parallelism and, uh, and a lot of other things like that mm-hmm. uh, are all characteristic uh, come are exemplified in the Hebrew Bible. Right. Uh, in our Book of Mormon studies, we find even, uh, in my opinion, even richer, more artistic examples of these rhetorical structures, and then you can find in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, I, I think you're right there. I mean, it's clearly, so clearly influenced, uh, or not just influenced, it is so clearly an example of hebrew and in some of its highest forms and so this is all coming from nephi right yeah 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 lehi and nephi and passed on down through uh well again this is one of the key roles that the brass plates plays a little bit like um honestly the we're we're strained from this a little bit right now but still a lot of the way we do english is influenced by being familiar with the king james version of the bible and shakespeare and it influences the way we uh word and phrase and think and so on and i think that the brass plates have to have played that role for nephite society that the highly literate the way they write, the way, the reason they're able to get these complex and wonderful and rich structures and phrases and poetic devices and so on that we see all throughout the Book of Mormon is coming. Well, I think you get two things, actually, in my opinion, you get it's the brass plates and the writings of Lehi and Nephi become kind of equal with the brass plates in terms of what the Nephites look to as their both religious, cultural and literary roots. And so Nephi's writings and the and and Lehi Jacob, I'd say those three and the brass plates are why we have all throughout the Book of Mormon this amazing literary structures. Uh, would you be tempted to go one step further? Sure, sure. <laughs> would might it be the case that the Hebrew rhetoric, which is developed in the seventh century in Jerusalem? in the Judahite schools is actually being borrowed from the Manassites. I mean, it, it, we can't tell, but it, it's coming from somewhere, right? So that's the question is who's really um, keeping these records. And that's something that's worth thinking about a little bit as well as we're talking about these brass plates. There are clearly at least somewhat separate scribal traditions in the North and in the South. 
uh, or we wouldn't have all these records in the brass plates that we don't have Absolutely. in in uh, in the Bible today. Um, and so, uh, who is dominant and who's not, or are they uh, are they intentionally? As you get the division between the North and the South, are they intentionally trying to counter distinct themselves um, and uh, and be separate from each other? Uh, and even when that's happening, there's going to be some influence and so on. Those are some really rich stories we can't answer too fully, yeah. but it's worth thinking about. I I think could, yeah, all we can do is speculate. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we can only speculate because they don't spell those issues out for us. Yeah. But, but, there's... but, but you know, that is another important uh, distinction between the Bible, the Old Testament, and the Book of Mormon. The Bible never tells you who's writing. Yeah. Who the author is. We know who the prophet is that's being quoted. Is uh, Jeremiah, we know, had his own scribe. Right. Name, He's the only one we know how it gets from it, the, the it, mouth it, to it, the word it. or the written text. But all the, nothing else. And we have the five books of Moses, uh, yeah. which we attribute to Moses as author. But um, it, clearly, but, the version know. we have is not original Moses. It's this is reworked and stuff added in and all sorts of other things, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, but the Book of Mormon, you always know who's writing the verse you're reading. Yeah, is yep. that anything? They they are more transparent than uh, than any anyone else really and it's it's as i try to explain to my students uh we what we don't know about compiling the bible but also what we do know the book of mormon is the thing that makes it easiest for them to understand i can explain it to to latter-day saint students easier than anyone else because they mm -hmm. get intuitively oh yeah well you get a mormon who has all these records and he puts them together and so on they get it intuitively because mormon spelled it out for us right yep. no one spilled that out on the other but this it's a, a group is doing the same thing that mormon did uh, yeah. and probably more than one time but well we get it in the book of mormon too you got moroni also thrown in there and and so on but uh yeah I, i'm so grateful for the transparency uh kind of the the we could almost call it the the meta record keeping of yes. uh of the book of mormon well it reflects the scribal attitude yeah yeah it, it's the it's the attitude you and i have we write a paper and we have footnotes that document every you know everything we got from anybody else there yeah. it is we tell yeah. who it is who we got it from and that's that's a mentality that is reflected in the book of mormon well uh, yeah you're right and this is uh, as i think about it i hadn't uh, realized that maybe uh, this is a good way to wrap up and and then give you a final word but um what a great way to start our book of mormon study year when we're uh, we're about to read all the stuff written on these plates to talk about how did we get it how did we get the writing <laughs> what's the what's the the mechanism of that writing that's what i do in all of my classes like i said yeah. in that that ancient near eastern text class the first day we're going to have them try writing on clay and on papyrus and on leather and everything else, uh, just because if you're going to understand the text, you got to understand a little bit about how in the world you got the text. So this is a good way to start out. So I appreciate the material side of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. I've enjoyed visiting with you. Uh, likewise, and and I hope that uh, for our audience that this has been uh, helpful and insightful. We're just uh, like we said, doing some deep dives on a couple things, but I, I think it can help us understand the Book of Mormon better. And so. Uh, we hope you'll share it with other people, like, subscribe, download, rate, review, uh, share, follow, all those different things. Um, but mostly we hope you'll uh, let this force you back into the text. We don't want to be a substitute for the text at all. We want this to be helpful in getting you back into the text and really pulling something from the Book of Mormon yourself. So we, we hope that you'll do that. Uh, and we hope you'll, you'll tune in next week. Uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of fun. Well, we're actually going to have Noel on again as we uh, talk about First Nephi chapter 10 and Phil Allred uh, also talking about First Nephi 10 and kind of tying that together, with, but a different aspect than, than Noel's talking about, but uh, tying it into chapters uh, 7 and 8 and so on. So uh, we've got some great stuff uh, to look forward to next week as we return on The Scriptures Are Real. Thank you again, Noel. Yeah.